In this video, we're going to talk about the ER treatment of abdominal pain. Hey, what's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So if you've worked in the ER for any time at all, you know that abdominal pain is probably the most common complaint bringing people in. And because that's the case, as ER nurses, we really need to know how to treat abdominal pain and what interventions to anticipate. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. So if you're ready, grab a drink and let's get started. So abdominal pain can signal a myriad of different issues from gastrointestinal problems all the way to cardiovascular abnormalities. And when we talk about abdominal pain, there are certain special populations that we should consider. So pediatric patients have a higher percentage of body water to body weight, and this makes them more at risk for dehydration when they have things like vomiting and diarrhea. And this is why we're so concerned about a child getting dehydrated when they have vomiting for prolonged periods of time. Now your geriatric patients are also at risk for dehydration when they have things like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And this is because at baseline, your elderly population isn't really taking in as much fluid. They're not drinking enough water. So when they have gastrointestinal losses, they don't have that reserve built up and they can get dehydrated. Now, when we talk about assessing abdominal pain, one of the first questions that we should ask is where is the abdominal pain located? Which quadrant is it in? When we talk about abdominal pain being in the right lower quadrant, we typically think things like appendicitis. When we talk about abdominal pain being in the right upper quadrant, we typically think things like gallbladder. Epigastric pain that does or does not radiate to the back can be pancreatitis. Epigastric pain that does not radiate can also mean things like gastritis or an inflammation of the stomach. Lower abdominal pain, especially pain that's in the left lower quadrant, can mean things like diverticulitis or constipation. Lower abdominal pain can also signal things like a urinary tract infection. And then diffuse abdominal cramping can signal things like gastroenteritis. So another question that we should ask is when did the pain start? And here, go ahead and ask about food intake prior to the pain and if food intake makes the pain better or worse. And I also like to ask about other associated symptoms, whether the patient's having chest pain, whether they're having shortness of breath, whether they're having nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, and if they are having vomiting or diarrhea, do they have any blood in either of those? And then some other questions that we can ask are, when was your last bowel movement? that can signal us to constipation or a possible bowel obstruction. Also, if the patient's having diarrhea, have they been on any antibiotics recently? If the patient's having nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, has anybody at their home been sick with similar symptoms? And then we can ask the patient about previous abdominal surgeries because this can clue us in to what the cause of the abdominal pain is and what it's not. If the patient's had their appendix out, then they're obviously not gonna be coming to the ER for something like appendicitis. So you should get a urine sample on pretty much all of your abdominal pain patients. If it's a female, that can clue us in to whether she's having a UTI or if she's pregnant. And you'll pretty much get a urine HCG on all of your female patients unless they're older or they've had a hysterectomy or something like that. A urine sample can also clue us in to things like hydration status. What's the specific gravity gonna look like? Are there ketones or proteins in the urine? So if you're sitting at triage and an abdominal pain patient walks in, go ahead and collect a sample on them. So you'll almost always get labs on these patients. And typically you'll just go ahead and start an IV and get your labs at the same time because you're probably gonna be giving things like fluids, nausea, and pain medications. So as far as what a CBC is gonna look like, the white blood cell count is gonna be elevated with inflammation, infection, or even vomiting. 
A hemoglobin level will be low in cases of GI bleeding. And if this is the case, you're gonna need to get an occult stool sample as well to check for blood in the stool. And then platelets are gonna be low in things like liver failure because of the liver's inability to produce a hormone called thrombopoietin, which makes platelets. So as far as your CMP, your BUN is gonna be high in cases of dehydration. Your potassium is gonna be low with things like vomiting and diarrhea. And then your liver function tests like your AST, your ALT, and your bilirubin are gonna be high with things like gallbladder problems, liver disease, or pancreatitis. Now, as far as other tests, your clotting times like your PT, PTT, and INR are gonna be high with liver failure. Your ammonia level is also gonna be high with liver failure. And then your amylase and lipase will be elevated with pancreatitis. Now, depending on the age of your patient and where the pain is located, you might anticipate getting an EKG to rule out things like MI. And this is especially true if the patient's having pain that's epigastric in nature. Now, as far as imaging goes, ultrasounds are best for looking at the gallbladder. The provider may also order a CT that can be with or without contrast, and that can tell us about appendicitis, diverticulitis, colitis, bowel obstruction, kidney stones, or free air in the abdomen. And free air in the abdomen, that's a bad thing. And then abdominal x-rays, which we abbreviate KUB, detects air as well. And it can tell us about looped bowel, bowel wall thickening, or colon dilation. Now we already talked about starting an IV and getting a urine sample, but you can also anticipate giving things like IV fluids, nausea, and pain medication. You can anticipate electrolyte replacement, especially potassium if the patient's been having vomiting or diarrhea, and you should keep the patient NPO, especially since we don't know if this is something surgical yet. And this is gonna be one of the most daunting tasks because even if your patient's been vomiting, drinking water is all they wanna do. Sometimes it's their first priority. Anticipate antibiotics if it's appendicitis or diverticulitis. If it's a bowel obstruction, the patient's typically gonna need an NG tube, which we'll do in the ER. And then the ultimate disposition of these patients, whether they go home, they go to the OR, or they just get admitted is going to depend on what's causing the pain and how sick they are. If you have a stable patient with diverticulitis, they might be able to go home on outpatient antibiotics. But if you have a patient that's having appendicitis, then they're going to need to go to the OR to get that appendix out. Hey guys, welcome back. If you got value out of this video, then give it a big thumbs up. And if you missed my other ER videos, then click the link over here. Otherwise, make sure that you subscribe so you never miss another post. Stay safe and I'll see you guys next time.